Exactly. Okay, let's go. So, Mike, I have seen you on Instagram and like from the moment I caught or captured you, I can't remember how I came across you or what happened. Uh, and I just thought, yeah, you just get that kind of Omnamar Shivaya moment where it's just like, it doesn't matter. I just like, I'm comfortable. I get this. I need it in my, I need it in my feed. <laughs> oh, good. I don't know what you think, Mike, but um, I think there's some kind of like Shiva thread that does kind of run through digital. We kind of, um, I'm sure a lot of people recognize you as in recognize your essence or whatever you want to call it. But I do think with um, some of the lineages and maybe um, Vishnu lineages will feel the same way in other, in other manners. But I think something just pops and cracks and you just kind of, it's recognition. Um, so uh, I just wanted to begin as we mean to go on. Um, my lineage is from the Shiva essence. It was from our Guruji up was in Bar was in Baroda. Um, so um, these aren't things that are of the mind. They're just things that are of some other nature. And um, I needed to kind of present that to you as how I recognized you or how something you may recognize you. And I am so happy to have uh, the opportunity to hear your interpretation of um, magic, mysticism and meditation so that other people can hear what it's like to be in India and be living that experience. So can you, would you start by kind of telling people, I guess you have to kind of begin with what brought you to it and in particular, what has taken you to India and what is the essence there that it just isn't anywhere else? Well, I think I'll, I'll speak a little bit towards the Shaivism side of things. And so at the heart of Shaivism is that it comes very naturally. Like for me, I think my first Shaiva lineage was um, growing up as a child in the forest in Canada and just getting this understanding that everything had a spirit, nature had a spirit. It's not just a fox looking at you in the forest. There's, it's like great spirit is speaking with you kind of idea. And that's really the heart of Shaivism is, is a lot of this kind of tribalism, right? And so that mixes in, that's where you start getting into the mystic sort of ideas as well, right? All of that. And really all a mystic is, is a mystic, like your average religious person is someone who believes in God. Yeah. A mystic is some, essentially someone who just believes God is everywhere. Um, we're a little bit radical, right? That's why people are scared of us and they kind of go, oh, they're kind of a weirdo, um, right? Because people who just believe in God, they're probably like on the middle point of spirituality. From below them, you start getting atheists and the rest of that. And then above them, it, that whole world above them is kind of weird from there on out. But part of what that means is that we... We kind of, we worship nature, right? We worship, um, we worship shark. Limitations, Maya, all of this is actually our form of power in this world, right? And so you get someone say they specialize in something. Well, they really, really limit themselves. They just don't do all that other stuff, but they really gain something really powerful and special by, by put it, placing all those limitations on themselves. And so another thing that's very important with Shaivism, I think, is essentially a lot of these Babas, they say, well, Shiva is sacrifice. And so what a Shaivite's always kind of doing is sacrificing to, to Shakti, to nature, right? It's always a kind of, you're sacrificing to all these spirits of nature. But it's not like, well, the sacrificial act, you slit an animal's throat or whatever, that's still going on in India, of course, but that's not really what sacrifice is about. Right? For example, if you want to specialize in something, um, you have to sacrifice for that. But then they would also say, if you really love something, you sacrifice for that thing. It's not that you get this and that from that. I sometimes ask yogis, do you love yoga? 
well, what have you sacrificed for yoga? Right? What have you sacrificed for that way of life? I know it does all these great things for you, but what have you done for it? And I don't really want an answer, just something for people to think about, right? Um, because that's really what Shaivism, these are kind of the things that are really at the heart of Shaivism. And that's kind of why, like, it kind of sticks to this tribalism. Well, they want to be free. There's, a, there's definitely that strong element of freedom, um, which I think is a big difference between, say, something like, like Shaivism and, and Buddhism, for example, where the Buddhists, they don't want to suffer. Yeah. And the Shaivites are like, well, I don't really care if I suffer as long as I'm free. Mm. You know? And then the other side of that is, well, if you're going to sacrifice something, well, if you're not suffering, it's not much of a sacrifice. <laughs> right so you want to sacrifice something really really big so well tantra is all about transformation so how about you sacrifice your whole life and take a new path right sacrifice everybody and you think you're here now and just go and leave that place and start something new yeah yeah so it's like um do you think therefore it appeals to the the mavericks the kind of those that maybe look at me talking about my childhood, but those who were maybe, you know, felt nonconformist and then um, all of a sudden it's like, it's permission granted to be um, not radical in the tantric sense, but more nonconformist in the, I've got, you know, a lot of questions and also, you know, that recognizing of the prana shakti, because um, I just feel that maybe part, um, part of this radical or maverick nature that we have, and then we manage to go somewhere like India and we'll see a guru or something like that. And then they're kind of like um, with the sadhus or the Shivites, and they meet you with that gaze and it's like, oh, okay, like, challenge accepted or are they like I see you I see you and like how would you describe that formidable force and how that appeals to the maverick nature rather than the comforting buddhist kind of well the big thing is is, is I'll tell you a story like there's a reason why Shakti married Shiva actually Vishnu asked to marry her first and she said no no you can be my brother thank you very much and she went and married Shiva because Shiva is willing to sacrifice for Shakti. He doesn't want to control Shakti. Whereas Vishnu wants to control nature and organize it and put everything in order, you could say. Where Shiva just wants to appreciate Shakti, you could say. Essentially, you could say in a way, Shiva wants to make Shakti free. Um, and so he, he becomes that thing that she dances upon eventually, right? Um, and she's able to dance like that because Shiva's there, right? If Shiva's not there, she'll have trouble dancing like that. And you can think of that in very modern terms as well, right? Being a woman, if you have some strong man that's sitting in the back, you can go crazy in the middle floor. You're perfectly safe, right? And so there's some of that kind of masculine feminine aspects going on in the Shaivism as well. Um, but again, Shiva doesn't want to control. And so that... I really noticed this, like, because I, I really recognize my, my strong Shaivism. And like I said, it came very naturally. I was traveling around India for a couple of years, actually, before I even realized. I was like, wow, everywhere I go is a Shiva place. I better, like, look into this guy. Who's this Shiva guy? Exactly. Right? I knew a little bit, but, like, what something's going on here. I got to look into. Um, and so I saw how my life just naturally went to it. But. Really, if we're yogis, what we're trying to do, in a sense, though, is we want to actually balance our, our Shiva and our Vishnu. We're yogis. We're finding balance between them. Um, and so that's a lot of work for Shivites, right? Because we're like, no, I don't want to order my life. I don't want any control. I just want to be free. But in a way, what we kind of find is we actually become more free after we kind of sacrifice something, after we've kind of achieved something. Right after we put some limits on ourselves, and then we can be free after. Mm -hmm. 
it's that kind of sacrifice always comes first in a sense that welcome discipline almost that you've been seeking that is in empowering to put it in western terms rather than limiting yeah. like we see a shivite in india and it's like they can handle anything they just go out and sleep on the rocks beside the river right and get up and bathe in the river and take a drink and take a walk until they get some chai right someone says chai oh well I some chai um yeah so like the shavites are tough they're really 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 tough people and that's basically what i did on the, on that karikrama right i walked out i walked almost two thousand kilometers in that three months when i was by the river and this was very interesting because there's a lot of i won't name their region but there's a lot of vishnavas very strong Vishnava's kind of Krishna people out uh, doing this Parikrama. Mm -hmm. And Vishnava's are all about rules. You all, everything has the way you wave your incense has to be just right. And Shiva's like, well, what they say about Shiva's, he accepts anything, mm -hmm. any offering. That's why you can offer booze or ganja or wine or whatever, you, everything that's prohibited. Because he doesn't care, he'll take anything. Um, but this Vishnava is you have to give it just kind of the right way and there's prescribed rules, things have to be done. And so they kept reminding me of what these rules are. And I kept telling them to shove it. <laughs> like you're in the jungle, man, there's no rules here. Get over your Vishnavism, just relax, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they really wanted to order their days, be here by that point and be there by that point. And I'm like, that tree shade is beautiful, man. Have you, have you bathed in this river? Um, that's that Shiva, right? I just want to just enjoy. Um, and so then a lot of it then becomes a little bit like, well, how do I live a beautiful life? Right? Forget about the suffering, forget about maybe I can't even be free. That's a little bit tough, but how can I live a really beautiful life? And so these kind of really are parts of that mystic sort of life because you have to, you have to feel it you're getting your information from something that's not physical that's beyond this world yeah. um and that well it's, on one hand it's maya right that's why the orthodox people call us all the devils um because we're kind of we're worshiping maya because we can see that she all has spirit every stone every stick every that's why we have all the sticks on the altar and the stones on the altar too right because we acknowledge that there's spirit in that and well that's frowned upon by the orthodox people like you're worshiping a rock you're worshiping a stick that's a stupid thing mm -hmm. right? come worship my statue <laughs> um but then there's also this idea in yoga that you can worship god with form or without form mm -hmm. and they say worshiping a god with form is much easier but i find it's more the mystic path the shiva path to worship without form because that's what the Shiva Linga represents, a god without form. They put a stone in front of the divine architect and said, make a, make a statue of God. And he looked at this and he said, well, I can't do anything. I said, okay, well, let's just leave it then. <laughs> um, so then you go to Shiva Linga. Um, and there's a lot like Shiva Lingas too, when you read into it, they have a lot to do with uh, like spring waters. Right. Nowadays, they always keep them moist, but I think the really, really old traditional ones had the water coming up. That's life. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that life is represented. That's the spirit in the stone that's bringing up life mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, you say then in that sense that um, because I'm back in England now, um, well, I'm actually in Wales. Um, and what I have, it's funny with you saying what you're saying, because um my um, in the air smelling in the air shiva experience isn't there but i feel drawn to nature but like very simply just very simply wanting to be as close to nature as possible um how would i i'm no i don't want to get like um to into kind of this is right and that is wrong but i just want to take the shiva conversation now and look at how um our tendency in the west to clean things up um 
how that is mistaken for simplifying or educating. Um, and how how would you talk about that in terms of the Shiva from India versus what then we misinterpret maybe through our DNA cultural way of being? Well, if we look at the tantric scriptures, they talk about four means to realization. And the first means is, is a lot of technical stuff, a lot of what we do in yoga, pranayama, and some meditation, and all of this sort of thing. And the second one is they call it Shaktapaya. And this is basically the tantric path is Shaktapaya. And it's a little bit less technical. It's a little, the lines are a little bit blurrier on how you do it. But essentially what it is, self-reflection, right? You use everything in this world to reflect upon yourself. And that's kind of like, in a way, that's what even uh, uh, Descartes was saying, I think, therefore I am. In a way, what he was also saying is, well, there's something other than me going on here. And because there's something other, I am able to recognize that I am. And so that's really what the tantric path is doing. It's that continual self-reflection. And then how you get power in tantra ultimately becomes by taking greater and greater responsibility, right? Personal responsibility for things. And then I would put in there as well that there's a certain level, like if you really want to attain anything and it truly, there has to be a certain level of self-respect there as well, right? Without that self-respect, well, you can't respect nature. You can't respect mother. So then where are you going to go with that? And so these things to me are all kind of parts of, of that being able to self-reflect, being able to treat everything with respect and divine intention. And the thing is, like, when you have self-respect, you don't talk about being able to do anything. You're free to do anything. Well, if you have self-respect, you are free to do anything because you're not going to mess it up and make a whole bunch of karma and just, right, like that. Yeah. You can do it with that purity, that pure intention. And in a way, what we're trying to do is change our karma into kriya, which is the spontaneous action. Mm. It's pure, it's clean. It's not planned, it's not premeditated it's the spontaneous beautiful gesture right and so to get there you need to have self-respect basically <laughs> or you're not going anywhere um and you well, you can have a lot of fun by just being like free and not doing anything but and i see it in goa like um later in life you start to have a more difficult time because well when you're young your shakti is strong and vibrant but as you age, that outer image becomes less and less effective for you. And you have to lean on what you have inside of yourself. Yeah. If you have nothing inside of yourself when you're old, you're screwed, man. <laughs> right? And so we're always trying to build ourselves, get new abilities, learn new things, see things from other people's perspective. Nothing is wrong. Nobody's wrong. There are different places on the path. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Right? limitations to knowledge that we're all struggling with in one way or other well yeah i want to change tack slightly because i guess like the last time i was in varanasi um i had the usual experiences with um prana shakti or with passing um, maybe someone in a deep state of meditation in those stone tombs that they have there or something like this. And um, I'm often trying to, um, not often, no, <laughs> but I sometimes find myself trying to explain the physicality, the actual sensory feeling of prana coming from another individual who is either in a deep state of meditation or um, you you can sometimes get it from photographs can't you but we're talking about this is not a theory this is a real sensory experience that can be transposed from one um, jivat man or one soul to another felt experience can you talk a bit about that for people who are maybe looking at things like the pranic body but not really understanding how that is 
felt in the real terms? Well, so we all have a certain energy to us. And we experience this day to day. You meet someone new, right away you get a little bit feeling about them. You know, if you like them, you know, if you don't like them, go away from me. You're repelled, you're attracted, right? Maybe you don't do anything about it. You just feel that inside even, right? And that happens, you look around a room and it happens amongst everyone. But when you meet someone who's been really purifying their essence, you could say, you're not used to meeting that. So you, you feel something different when you come there. Right? You don't know what it is. And well, that's a lot of like, a lot of the mystic healing traditions are essentially shamanic. And what they're trying to do is, is a lot the same as um, like Japanese Zen cones are trying to do. They're trying to like, well, cut off your head. That's what Tantra wants to do. They want to chop your head off. So you can't think anymore. Your mind, your brain, everything that doesn't work. You have to reach somewhere higher for your support in a sense. And there's some shock therapies like really brutal paths of Tantra can do to do this. Very dangerous stuff, of course, right? Um, but a lot of it's, it's much sort of gentler sort of ways that we just sort of like a Zen cone, you're confused, you don't know what to think anymore. And so you just have to feel it. Right. And so while we're doing this all the time, but in a way, all those thoughts and everything that's in between is kind of like we can't, it's a barrier to feeling that. And so the meditation and, and like even something like studying astrology and studying these kind of mystic things, what we're trying to do in life is, well, we want to study particular things and particular people. And we want to learn all about Shakti, you could say, all about Mother Nature. But we want to do that in order so we can kind of reflect upon ourselves and get to know ourselves. And I was going somewhere with that, it slipped my mind. Um, gone <laughs> it's just a sort of a sense of getting subtler and subtler oh, yeah. yeah i know where i was going to it that it's a sense of bringing our awareness from the particular to the universal mm -hmm. and the more we can associate things with the universal aspects of them mm -hmm. i see a woman and i associate her with the universal aspects of woman sister you could say um then what happens is we're kind of free in a way, I just treat her like sister. I don't treat her like this person. I just give her the same kind of respect that I would give any of this great sister element, you could say. Um, but it also frees us from those, like all these little particular details in a sense. It's like when someone dies in India, the whole death ritual is to tell that spirit to go away. We don't want you here. And what they're trying to do is break from the individual spirit so that they just remember that universal aspect of Papa. Mm. Whether Papa was good or bad doesn't matter. Mm. He's just the universal father. And whatever, every day on Father's Day, I'll worship that universal father mm. because he gives me everything I have. Right. Mm. Um, so, in that sense, then, if um, this refining and refining, um, happens for the individualized soul so that we can become more attuned to others around us and therefore ourselves um, and use it as a reflective tool what do you feel is happening um, in the world right now in in the greater maya of um, the world as it appears to us at this moment in time, how would you interpret that as uh, something to reflect on and then make, therefore make the most of in this lifetime? Yeah, it's funny. Um, well, I sometimes feel my, my job as a yogi is to try to bring things together. And so you look out there and you can just see everything is being pulled apart, it seems like. But there's an interesting relationship between like, a, I don't know, a victor and a loser. Um, there's an interesting relationship between our 
personal life and our private life or our public life, sorry. And there's this interesting kind of relationship, even like if we look into bad relationships, we, there's an interesting relationship between like the sadist and the masochist, for example, right? The, the master and the slave kind of relationship. And this is the relationship, it's the two polar opposites that have to relate in some way. And they don't know how to do this. So we're getting this clash, but in a way it's like, well, they need each other. <laughs> and so we need, well, time kind of like expands and contracts, you could say, right? And so this is just another movement in time, essentially. Like I do the, I do Vedic astrology also. And one of the big lessons from that is time really is just an illusion, right? If I can predict your future, it's kind of the same as saying it's already happened. Right? So if everything's already happened, we don't worry about it too much. When I tell people, like I got some activist people I do astrology with, and I say like, if you really feel like that's your fight, that you need to stop that or to do something, it's, don't fight to actually stop it. Fight because you know you have fight in you. Yeah. And use that as a channel for your energy. But release any expectations of anything happening. Um, and I get, I get clients from both sides of the political spectrum. Yeah. Like, well, if that's your fight, man, like, go for it. Um, because who am I really to judge and try to convince someone, like, right? Who am I going to convince? Like, it's a funny thing about rights is um, human rights, you could say, when we come to that clash of human rights, both sides are usually right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's why there's a problem. <laughs> it's not one is right and one is wrong. Um, and so, anyways, the impasse to that is communication, essentially, yeah. right? That's how, that's how you connect with the other, yeah. communication. And then the tantric would say, well, use all your senses if you really want to connect with someone. And in a way, that's what we're trying to do with tantra is really more deeply connect, not with just someone, but with everything, so that I can see the spirit in the tree, that I can see inside of you and many people say this they're like i just want to be seen yeah you know i just want someone to see me for me forget all this crap on the outside really see me deeply and so that's what we're trying to learn in tantra we're trying to see everything much much more deeply ourselves included as much as we can see inside of ourselves we can see inside of others and that's where that mysticism comes because when you can start to see deeply inside yourself and others you can start to predict the future you can really know people deeply just by sitting near them you, for me it's a sense of getting to know that i know the energies i feel these energies from people from everywhere you could say yeah. in a very sensitive way mm. that's why tantra has to be tough <clears throat> So, um, what do you feel um, could be happening when we travel to places like India and we um, when we bring something? Uh, no, let me phrase this slightly differently. I think there's something very interesting that people want to still go to India. And obviously people going on like for various different reasons, like you and I have probably spent a lot of time at chai stops and they are fantastic because it's like an ecology of the human being. <laughs> Everyone is there, like all manner of human is at the chai stop. Like yeah. it could be solved at the chai stop as well. Um, so I don't want to say that only a particular type of person wants to go to a place like India because you get all kinds of cats there and that's why it's so cool. Um, but what is it, do you think, that that kind of location um, is offering out to the world that they are just not getting anywhere else, if that is at all true? And then what do you think like, is the greater game that's at play there? Well really big part of it um, would be I'm going to talk about the Western people coming to India because the Asian people it's a little bit different 
the, the Western people are coming to India and well, they're, they're coming to India for the same reason a man wants a woman in his life. Because once you do that, once you see that opposite, you see yourself. And so you come here and you get in all these ever cultures different. And like I'm from Canada and they say, well, Canada has no culture. But of course, as soon as I come to India, I was like, wow, Canada has a culture. That's amazing. Um, and so you really get to see yourself. But there's a couple other like from astrology, there's a couple of reasons people travel or they're connected to a couple of things. What is this 12th house Pisces thing represents like these foreign travels? You go kind of as far away from yourself as you can. Uh, this house is also meditation. It's also your, um, they call it ancestral spirits. It's your really, really deep subconscious mind. And so what happens when you come to a place like India is you get in touch with that. You lose yourself because whatever you knew before is no good here. And also, you can also, you can suddenly, you can be anybody you want as well, right? And so you really get in touch with, well, in a sense, that 12 house is also a dream life, a fantasy life. Um, what I would say, like, especially in the first time or two that you were to come to India, I would say it's, it all has to do with ancestral healing, right? Because you're getting away from your life, you're actually draining vitality away from your life at home or you could be working and making friends and right adding to your house and adding to your family building something so you go away from all of that um and so while well, you're sacrificing for your ancestors essentially is what astrology would say um yeah it's a loss it's kind of a it's a kind of a moksha also right it's in a lot of ways it becomes a waste of money because you go home and Nobody understands any of your stories or cares about anything you did there anyways. And, um, and so 12th house also has to do with some kind of loss expenditure. Uh, but you're giving that money to your ancestors, essentially. Mm -hmm. so. I think that's um, one of the most beautiful ways I've ever heard it, it uh, described to me. I really feel what you're saying. I really get it. I get that it's like this strange, it's going back to what you were saying about the Shivites and the um, shavenism of the giving up, what are you sacrificing? I think you're, a lot of people sacrifice a lot to do that kind of, and maybe not in the worldly terms, but certainly in their own lifetimes to take these long trips to India. Yeah. And I just love the way you indicated, you know, that when you get back and you're like, this happened and that happened, or and they're like, yeah, whatever. What's your yeah. balance? <laughs> yeah, it, it has nothing to do with them or their life. They yeah. don't care. <laughs> yeah. like, I just come across like as, well, you can come across as just crazy. Yeah. You may have had like these deeply scholastic, intellectual experiences and real deep stuff going on. And but as you explain it to your family or, or your friends and you get back and it's like, whoop, whoop. Uh, well, I find that quite funny. This actually, this is kind of an important point, actually, um, an important thing to realize, because in a way, if we talk about Tantra, if we talk about um, our God in Tantra, we talk about spirituality, a lot of these things, it's really hard to find words to really describe them anyways. Yeah. And they're very personal to us in a way. Our experiences, whatever, we've had those great moments of enlightenment or whatever, they're, they're very personal to us. And so it's like, it's like falling in love with someone, right? And uh, you don't know why you feel that, you just feel this great love for it. And if you just go out and like proclaim, just tell everybody that you're in love with this person, for example, People that don't know you well and don't really like you, maybe they're going to say, oh, him, he's got that stupid voice or that thing with his eye. Right. They have no respect for your love. They have no respect for your spirituality. They can't see it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's why we keep it a secret. Mm -hmm. That's why we more or less keep it to ourselves around other mystics, around other people that can see and experience it. OK, we talk about it. But to other people, they're just going to wipe their dirty feet on the thing that we love. Yeah. 
mm. right? And so it's not about keeping it a secret because all oh, will be judged by it. No, let's keep it a secret because these people have no respect for the spirit in a tree or the spirit in the rock. Yeah. So we'll leave them. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that really, I can just feel that kind of going. You know, it's this, um, it's a very, it's tough love, but it's, it's good tough love, you know, and it feels, it feels really nice. Um, okay, before we end, this conversation wouldn't be complete without talking about, I guess, meditation. Um, and I'm not going to kind of guide you in any particular way, but if you just want to kind of maybe talk a little bit about meditation before we, before we close. Well, I guess, um, so I follow a meditation manual called, in English, the translation is called the uh, Stanzas on Vibration. Mm -hmm. It's the main manual I follow for meditation. But, and so the point of meditation, what we're starting to realize is, is consciousness, you could say, a kind of pure state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And there's different states of mind that we can recognize and we can see and we can be aware of. Um, Kind of on the path there right we have uh, kind of that way another way we're trying to get in touch with a more and more subtle understanding um subtle experience of reality and with our meditations and so a lot of that has to do with awareness i often like well they also talk about four means to realization in tantra and the first being like this, it has a lot to do with like body awareness practices, yoga awareness practices. Who am I as a body? Who am I as a, as a inner being, right? Who am I as an individual person? And so we're trying to do that with the astrology. It has a lot to do with that. Um, all these kind of techniques for self-realization, you could say. And well, that can take you right to the end, of course, right? But then they say, well, you get into that more subtle realm of meditation where now you start to really self-reflect on everything. So in a way, meditation then becomes kind of contemplation. You're not using any technique. You're not staring at a candle flame. You're not, right, breathing this way, like that, and, you know, you're not, you're just kind of contemplating deeply on life and the interactions you have between people and things. Um, and that's a really like a really deep stage of meditation, you could say, this kind of contemplation. But what happens also is now our mind goes from being on the kind of the body and mind. Now we're really in this more subtle sort of intellectual feeling sort of a realm, you could say, a little bit energetic, a little bit, um, you could say, the dream state, right? Things don't have to conform to reality. They can be a little bit blended. But if we we're going to understand it, then it has to, there's some order a little bit, right? In the sentences of the mind. And so then what they say is we just kind of contemplate things and watch our thoughts and watch our reactions to things and think about that. And then the, the kind of third stage is more this sort of free stage. You, you just turn your thoughts towards consciousness and kind of wonder about this a little bit. You can get there very quickly that stage they say and then of course the, the fourth stage is um you don't do anything you just always know everything is but what this kind of means in reality the experience of this in a sense is well at the, at the highest stage you might still like be aware of your thoughts and your emotions and all of this coming on but what's happening is your activity is coming directly from you can say that directly from consciousness to activity, right? It's a free Kriya activity that you're performing when you're in touch up there. In a sense, you could say we're always performing that activity direct from Kriya, but we're so much impurity and we have, so we have impurity of action because we have impurity inside and we can't recognize it because we're, the glass is dirty, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And well, this is actually important part two is is how do we burn karma and what is karma mm -hmm. karma is essentially debts and so actually a lot of the debts we have in life are just like people around us or 
we owe someone something somehow. And so those, a lot of that stuff can be paid off very quickly. Mm-hmm. Again, this is the first physical layer of yoga. Mm-hmm. Pay off all those physical debts. You don't owe anybody anything. You're free. Freedom, right? That's a big, big stage in freedom. And then you start to kind of more subtly, you pay off debts. So sometimes you can't, you can't pay the debt off directly. And that's kind of what the tapas is for. You take some austerity, you give some sacrifice, do something that's really, really difficult, right? And when you do that, that kind of cleanses you of some of those karmas that you can't, right? You can't just go and say, I just throw me in jail, I killed someone or whatever, right? I was rude to my mother, throw me in jail for five years. You kind of throw yourself in jail, yeah. right? You pay that, you find a way to pay that debt. And sometimes this is like these long pilgrimage treks, mm-hmm. right? Some hard, difficult thing. You take some vow, I'm going to do this mm-hmm. and get to there. Mm-hmm. And so those are paying off some of those more current, subtle ones. Again, to free us, it's just like when you owe somebody 10 bucks and you finally pay up and it's like, oh, I'm free. They're free too. You free them also. I really like that uh, analogy. I think that um, the way that you've just described karma there just makes sense practically. It makes sense emotionally, I think. um, And also, it's a very clever way of describing like the ritualistic nature of the practices and why you're doing it and go back to the austerity. It's not so that you can say, look what I did. It is really big. And we're always doing that. I don't think even people who want to say, look what I did. I think really we know that we were getting rid of some of that weird, icky feelings inside of ourselves from these debts that we owe, as you put it. Um, I think that's um, a really beautiful way of saying it. And then obviously the fact that um i love the way that you were saying like in the kriya is we're we're always connected to consciousness we're always have been and never have been anything other than that and how we slowly but surely through this contemplatory awareness start to recognize our true selves um so as a final thought then what would you say to many of us who are on the journey but feel that it's still a journey and we're still polishing the mirror as it were (laughs) Um, Um, what would you say to those people how you never stop polishing the mirror right Uh, your whole life is self-reflection you never come you always go beyond there's always more to do. There's no end to the journey. And so wherever you are in your journey, just accept yourself for who you are and where you are in that journey. Um, and But also try to do better in the future. Yeah. Right? And it's kind of a yogi's job as well. We have to balance these two things. I'm perfect. I can be better. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks so much, Mike. Um, I know that this uh, this conversation is going to like really like touch a lot of people. Um, and I don't mean by touching a lot of people, but you know what I mean. It's going to yeah. get in there. It's going to do whatever it needs to do. And um, I really appreciate your time. And um, I'll put it up on Instagram, um, what whatnot, and share it with you. But um, I just want to say thanks for being here on this earth in my lifetime, like you, your behavior, your way of being, um, even in this kind of strange digital way that we find ourselves. Like, um, I just love the way that the thread works and uh, it does work and it's working through you. So I want to say thank you very much. And I hope that we get to speak again. (laughs) Lovely. Thank you. Bye. I just stopped recording.